It has been a long time that whenever people just talk about making chloroform in the laboratories, they will immediately come up with reacting acetone with some sodium hypochlorite solution. But today, I really want to make it differently and just begin with my alcohol. So in normal ways, the chloroform is made by reacting acetone with sodium hypochlorite solution directly. The reaction here is called haloform reaction. To make it happen, it's necessary for the substrate to have carboxide in it. In the acetone base pass, the carbon-carbon bond on carboxide breaks to form chloroform and sodium acetate. So inspired by this, I actually just think about how you turn an ethanol into something with a carboxide in it. And for instance, the acetaldehyde comes to my mind. As for the new ethanol base pass, it breaks similarly to form chloroform and sodium format. So in a way, they are actually the same. So the next problem here is how to turn ethanol into acetaldehyde. The most cheap and easy way to make this is dehydronized ethanol with copper catalytics. To begin with, I have to prepare some unhydrous alcohol because the water in 95% ethanol would react with copper catalytic and make it unusable. I usually make anhydrous ethanol by refluxing the mixture of calcium oxide and 95% ethanol and then distill it to obtain anhydrous ethanol. And for those who want to know how much calcium oxide you actually need, according to calculation, the weight ratio of 95% ethanol and calcium oxide is about 5 to 1. So I need about 200 grams of calcium oxide. Particularly for the 75% ethanol, the ratio is changed to 5 to 6. So it would be better to do a fractional desolation before reacting the ethanol with calcium oxide. And now I prepare about 200 grams of calcium oxide and 1.25 liters of ethanol and reflux for 30 minutes. When it's done, I take away the condenser and build a desolation setup to collect anhydrous ethanol. The temperature of cooling water should be checked frequently during the refluxing or distilling, as the ethanol is highly volatile. And finally, I store the product in a 1 liter brown Boston bottle for a later use. Some people may told you that this is entirely anhydrous ethanol. Well, this kind of ethanol is anhydrous enough for most experiments, but there's actually still about 0.5% of water in it because calcium oxide couldn't react with water completely. And if you want to get some absolute ethanol, which means it's 100% without even a drop of water in it, it's necessary to react it with magnesium metal or molecule silver. And now it's the time to make copper catalytic. It's not recommended to use the copper oxide powder directly because the superficial area of it it's just too small to use. Instead, it's better to make it into copper acetate, then heat it up to make it reduce into some super small copper oxide powder, whose superficial area is much bigger than the former one. That could make the reaction going on much easier. Additionally, to avoid the super small powder stick together, I plan to make them stock on some kiss core to separate them from each other. So now I weigh about 2 grams of copper oxide and 3 grams of pure acetic acid and pour all of them into a copper with a few meters of water. You can also use the solution of it, but it's not recommended because it would take in too much water. A few minutes later, the reaction is done. Then I add 60 meters of 25% ammonia solution in it slowly and stir for half an hour. As ammonia solution is added, the blue color of the solution gradually deepens because diammonia copper ion, a deep blue ion, are formed. If ethanol is added to the solution at this point, deep blue diammonia copper acetate, a beautiful crystal, will precipitate. When it's all ready, I add about 9 grams of kisagur and stir for another 30 minutes. 
There shouldn't be any Lumia in the Kizikur, or it would decrease the yield. If you just buy the normal Kizikur, to make this, it should be reflexed in the 60% nitric acid for the next hour before using. Well, I just bought the Kizikur without any aluminum in it, so I didn't do that. Then, heat it up until it's boiled, and take the couple away to let it cool down. This can make the copper acetate get in the Kizikur. It's not necessary to worry about ammonia getting out of the solution. In fact, there's still lots of it in the solution. Now, I filter out all the Kizikur and wash it with some anhydrous alcohol and put them all into an evaporating dish. Then, heat it up with a gas stove until it all just turns into some black powder, which means the copper acetate is all reduced into copper oxide completely. For those who are curious about the effects of ammonia in the solution, when it's heated up, the ammonia just escapes from the copper iron and makes the kizagor much more porous and the superficial area bigger. As you can see here, the reaction is done. So I turn off the gas stove and let the catalytic cool down. Knowing that the dehydrogenized reaction absorbs heat energy and should go down under a relatively high temperature. At the very beginning, I just use an alcohol burner to heat up the glass tube with catalytic in it. However, the heating area and the heating power is just too small to use. So I then buy a 200 watts of heating wine, convolve it around the glass tube and wrap it with some glass wool. But after that, I find that the power of it is just too high. So it would be better to use a wine with 50 or even 30 watts power. So now, to avoid the powder from blowing out, I just put the glass wound at both sides of the glass tube and the catalytic in the middle. Well, in most cases, the ethanol vapor is diluted and taken out with nitrogen or aircon. However, not all this gas could be provided in my laboratory. So instead, I just order some dry ice online and replace them with some copper dioxide, which is just usable too. Well, if it's still not available or too expensive to use, simply using air is also acceptable. And with air, the reaction will be changed to this. And it's more convenient because it releases heat energy, which means it's not necessary to use electric heater. The only problem is that the yield would be cut in half, down to about 40%, and it's potentially explosive. So just be careful while working with your air pump. Since the boiling point of acetaldehyde is just around 20 Celsius, some dry ice is placed in the receiving flask to avoid the product from escaping too much. And finally, I got about 800 meters of raw acetaldehyde. To purify it, I make a simple distillation and collect the fractions around 24 Celsius. To increase the yield, the receiving flask is cooled down to about minus 78 Celsius in the mixture of dry ice and ethanol. After it's done, what I have here is about 600 ml of pure acetaldehyde. And to start the haloform reaction, I just pure all the acetaldehyde and some super thick sodium hypochlorite solution in it. The solution is made by reacting thick and cold sodium carbonate solution with calcium hypochlorite solution. There are actually two steps in the haloform reaction, and it's like what I've shown on screen now. And to make them in one time, some calcium hydroxide is also added in the solution to make the second step. The setup is then being placed in the ice bath and kept overnight to ensure the reaction is completely done. The next day, to obtain the chloroform, I just made a fraction of dissolution. As you can see here, some nice and clean liquid is getting into the receiving flask. And at last, I got about 600 meters of pure chloroform, and they're all being stored in a brown bottle to make it stable some ethanol is added to the chloroform because chloroform would react with oxygen when there's light and the ethanol would react with some extremely toxic light gas and protect me whenever I open up the bottle 
and to prevent light from getting to the bottle, some aluminum foil is wrapped outside the bottle. And that's all for today's video. And if you want to see more interesting video about chemistry, please subscribe me and see you next.